This morning in the service, we baptized a little boy, Edward Avery Bentz Wyatt, otherwise known as Bo. He was cute and he did a great job. <laughs> did not cry, and uh, his family was there, his extended family, his grandparents on both sides were there. And it always seems to me, whenever we have a baptism, that it's appropriate to think about what baptism means for all of us. I wonder out loud today, what it is that compels people in today's day and age to have their babies baptized. to live their lives 
in him, in Christ. To be rooted and built up in him, in Christ. To be established in the faith. And there's a way of understanding the Christian life that focuses on Christ being in us. The Holy Spirit being in us. And that's a legitimate part of the tradition. Elsewhere, Paul speaks of, of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And the story of the first Pentecost is about the Spirit of God coming upon and dwelling within all of the disciples. There's no question that we all carry the divine spark within us. I believe it's there in every child, every person, baptized or not. To be baptized is not to suddenly have the, the love of God poured into you or the Spirit placed in you. The love of God was there from the very beginning. All of that being said, it strikes me that baptism is as much or more about you and me being in Christ than it is about Christ being in us. It's about taking the tender seedling and planting it in the dirt of a faith community and the larger body of Christ so that that seedling can take root and grow into the fullness of who he or she was meant to be in Christ, which places a huge responsibility on all of us to be the kind of soil that can nurture spiritual growth. When we were committing a portion of Harry Hoff's ashes to the ground over the Memorial Park, the River Memorial Park a few weeks ago, Helen remarked on the red clay that we have in Virginia. And the hole that we dug up filled with red clay. And she spoke of how Harry always remarked fondly about the black Iowa dirt on the farm where he was raised. And my mom says that when she dies, she wants part of her actions and black Illinois dirt. That dark, rich soil is great for growing crops. And a portion of Harry's ashes will go in dark, rich, vile soil. Now let's not take the metaphor too far. Clearly, plants can grow and bear fruit in the red clay of Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia. There are nice plants and trees that are growing in our Greer Memorial Garden. Thanks to God, Betty Busey, and, and others who have worked on that plot of land. But the importance of good, rich, nutrient rich soil cannot be overstated. If you want to grow healthy plants, you have to make sure that they get the right amount of sun and the right amount of water, but you also need to make sure that they're planted in dirt that will nourish them. When Paul was writing to the Colossians, he was telling them that Jesus in his way lived out in community was good dirt. Writing to a bunch of people who were beginning to listen to other philosophies, other traditions, and empty deceit, Paul kept saying, you say, rooted and grounded in the soil of Jesus. That's what he said would help you to bear the fruit of love and compassion. Here's what that soil looks like. It looks like a group of people gathering over in the sanctuary or here in this space or in their homes for that matter to hear stories like the parable of the Good Samaritan who reaches out to the man in the ditch or, or the parable of the prodigal son whose father comes running out to greet him before he even sort of breaches the horizon. It looks like taking the Sermon on the Mount seriously when it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. It looks like loving your enemy and praying for people who persecute you. It looks like remembering that love, perfect love, casts out fear. It looks like reaching out to the other. That's what it means to be rooted and grounded in the soil of Jesus. The soil of Jesus looks like a child growing up in a community of faith where he learns that there are people who are not his blood relatives, not his teachers or coaches or schoolmates, who care about him and his well-being. We celebrate his accomplishments and support him to stand by him when he falters. Looks like confidence. 
formation mentors and Sunday school teachers and humans who challenged and comfort her and let her know that they are on the journey of faith with her. Fruit that gets born is seen in bracelets made for children in our doors. And the love we continue to have and show for our dreamers. And share food drives and tag tree gifts and prayer shawls and the effort to provide help and hope to refugee families. Being rooted and grounded in Jesus looks like welcoming a tender seedling, whether that's a baby like Bo Wyatt this morning, or whether that's a man who comes to a man in his 30s. It looks like welcome. This morning, we said goodbye to Kevin Holtz. Kevin, a seed, was planted in his community of faith eight years ago when he was transplanted from North Carolina. He came at the age of 30. He grew and thrived and bore fruit in our welcome. Good dirt and being planted in it matters. It matters a lot in a world where police are shot and mass shootings occur not just here but in Germany. And bombings happen in Kabul. And the accurate testimony of far too many is that the color of your skin continues to mean that you get treated differently. And candidates engage in childish Twitter wars. And religious people, because they are scared, are willing to abandon core tenets of Christian faith, all because they are afraid. It matters to be good soil grounded in Jesus. On Thursday morning, I heard this great story on NPR. A group of people was having a, a backyard picnic in Georgetown. And there was wine, and there was cheese. It was the perfect night. It was almost magical. And then all of a sudden, a man showed up in the backyard with a gun. He pointed it at them and demanded money right away. The only problem was that nobody in the group had any money. They didn't know what to do, so they started to try to reason with the man. One of the people in the group said, well, what would your mother think about what you're doing? He replied, I don't have a mother. I, I don't care about my mother. Then another person in the group said, would you join us for a glass of wine? <laughs> Somehow that flipped the script. And this gunman, while still holding the gun at first, said, Sure, I'll have some wine. <laughs> and he stood there and he drank his wine. And he helped himself to some cheese, too. And eventually, tucked his gun in his belt. And with tension still in the air, he asked, Can I have a hug? A few of the ladies in the room hugged him. Then he went on, Could we have a group hug? They gave him a group hug. Then the man left, and out in the alley, they found his wine glass not cast aside, not broken, but set down immediately. The commentary offered on this miracle story, which seems outlandish and certainly could not be counted on to happen all the time, <laughs> said that what happened here was that a group engaged in what is called non complementarity Non-complementarity is responding to hostility with hospitality, responding to anger with love, responding to the negative with the positive. And the commentator pointed out that this is what Martin Luther King Jr. did, and this is what Gandhi did. And I thought, wow, that sounds like Jesus. Then I wrote a friend's Facebook post. He shared the same story that I heard, and he commented, like I did, that sounds like Jesus. Then he went on to say, we could use a little bit more of that in our world. And maybe, even in the church, good 
stay 